Okay, so for today's class, we're talking about the Southern Asian um, subcontinents, as it's called, South Asia, and the rise and fall of the Indus civilization. So this is from your book, pages 518 through 546. And just to note, sometimes you'll hear me call um, this group the Indus after the Indus River in Pakistan, Today, today's Pakistan. It's also known as the Harappan. It's one in the same. So that term Indus, which is an older term, um, can replace Harappa or the Harappan civilization. Um, so without further ado then, um, our objectives for uh, this component of our class is to talk about the early Neolithic period, the early Stone Age period, and in particular, the site of Mahgar, um, which is on the Afghanistan side of the border, um, actually, but it preserves very well this whole sequence of archaeological layers um, and in situ domestication of plants and animals that are local to this environment. So um, it's important to note that a lot of the developments that happened in Mesopotamia also happened over here on this part of um, in Southern Asia, um, you know, hundreds of kilometers to the east of Mesopotamia. Uh, so we'll talk first about the regionalization phase and Kat DG, um, distinctive red slip pottery phase that shows up. And then the, the era of integration when we see the Indus civilization kind of coalesce around a central culture and theme. Um, and talk a little bit about its unique social organization, which is a bit different than other ancient societies um, in terms of its approach. And then it, uh, as things kind of deteriorate and uh, we see the eclipse of the Indus during the localization phase when um, that large regional shared culture sort of starts to break apart into um, localized um, groups once again. Um, so here's just a, a very, um, common map, ancient old world civilizations highlighted here. And one of the things to note is how they kind of crop up along the 38th parallel line of latitude, the 38th um, lat line of latitude here. You can see that uh, from north from the equator, the Indus is so similarly positioned to that uh, area of the Yellow River, the Shang Dynasty that appears in China. Um, and of course, uh, right in line with that would be the uh, Mesopotamia there in the center of this map between the Tigris and Euphrates River, uh, the Nile Valley, and of course, the, the Mediterranean cultures. Why do they show up in that time period, 3500 to 1000 BC, when we see these ancient old world civilizations all kind of show up in that um, same distance north of the equator? And one of the um, answers to that would be that there are seasonal differences there, that um, the change in season from winter to summer requires people to figure out agriculture in terms of developing a pro, um, uh, excess and to be able to store that food in a way that will get them through winter before the next growing season comes around. And so it could be that just because where it's positioned in climate and on earth, that the environmental situation there fostered the rise of these complex societies and urbanization. The other thing to note is these are in very um, uh, similar types of settings, river valleys, sometimes between two rivers like Mesopotamia. Uh, and the Indus also is between two rivers, the Indus in Pakistan and the Gagar Hakra River, which is now an extinct river that went underground. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, another characteristic is um, sort of wet dry seasons, a semi rainy season and a semi dry season um, in some of these places. So just keep that in mind um, as a sort of unifying theme of these ancient civilizations. And we're talking today about modern Baluchistan, um, a state in, um, in um, southern Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan region territories, probably familiar with that from. Uh, the Afghanistan wars that have been going on now for 20 years, probably longer than uh, many of you have been alive. But it looks like this today. And check out this village there in the region 
not that un different than Neolithic villages that we're going to be talking about in terms of um, mud brick architecture, um, local pastoralism, local farming and herding. So people have been living this life way for thousands and thousands of years, and it's worked well for this environment and for their cultures. Um, the Indus region here, Northwest India, um, and Pakistan primarily for the civilizations, but it begins across the border on the other side of the mountains in Afghanistan. So in this map, you can see the Indus River region shaded in lighter green with ancient sites in yellow triangles and modern cities in red dots. You have a, a river here, the Indus, and then the, you can see where the extinct Gagar Hakra River is. And some of those ancient cities are along that extinct courseway along with the Indus. So that could be part of the reason for the decline of the Indus or Harappan civilization is that that river goes dry, the water goes underground. Um, we'll talk about various reasons why that may have happened um, further on in this, in this talk. So early Neolithic food producers in South Asia, in Western Pakistan, Baluchistan region here, um, 6,500 BC is very early. We're starting to see this process of domestication. And important to note the Bulan Pass area through these mountains, which allows you to get um, easier pass from Afghanistan into the Indus Valley in Pakistan um, through that uh, Bulan Pass, which is still heavily used today, but was it would have been an important trade route back then as well. Um, by 6,500 BC, and a little after small agricultural villages, start to emerge. Uh, Magar is one important one. We'll uh, also mention Kiligu uh, Muhammad and the Rana Gundai sites um, as well preserve this early Neolithic um, sort of um, archaeology um, as, it, as it happened. So here's the Bulan Pass today. You can see the little um, Afghanistani boy sitting in the creek there, beautiful fresh water. It's a very rich resource in this dry part of the world. And then the train that kind of goes through this pass is a famous picture here um, where the, the railroad goes through um, the pass, otherwise formidable mountains, um, not easy to cross. Uh, here's a cr cultural chronology for the Indus region, archeological phases uh, that we will mention. Uh, the date is on the left from 7,000 to 5,500 BC is phase one of the Magar, a ceramic, Neolithic, no ceramics, but Neolithic phase. And we start to see early food producing during this time, the first phases, initial phases of cattle domestication and some plant domestication is happening there. Between 5,500 to 3,300 BC, we can sort of lump Magar uh, two through levels um, six, the ceramic Neolithic period, in the first phases of the regionalization of, of what starts to happen there. After 3,300 BC, so you can see very early, almost the same age as Mesopotamia, we have early Harappan emerge. Um, and between 3,300 and 2,800 BC, specifically Harappan I or the Ravi phase, uh, named after its style of ceramics or pottery that we start to see during the ceramic uh, producing um, period. A uh, very key period, 2800, 2600 BC, Harappa II phase, or what we would call the Kat DG phase, um, represented uh, first at Magar levels seven, but that Kat DG ceramic sort of really takes off and spreads. Um, from 2600 to 1900, mature Harappan civilization, this era of integration, uh, and then late Harappa, 1900 to 1300 BC, when things start to sort of go back to the local. Um, localization and that strong central cultural control fades away. So let's take period 1A from Magar. Uh, we're starting to see local varieties of wheat. Here's some uh, a picture of some wild wheat there, very similar to what was domesticated over in um, Iran and Iraq, uh, Mesopotamia. Barley is partially domesticated by then. Wheat already domesticated this very early period. Dates and fruit are wild, but they're collected. They're hunting lots of, there's that same sort of crop complex that we see in Mesopotamia, but um, uh, wild varieties of, of zebu cattle, which are unique to this region. And that's how one reason why we know that they're doing the same sorts of things that happened in Mesopotamia on their own 
And it's not just the spread of this kind of way of life from Mesopotamia into this region. These behaviors are also going on in Afghanistan, um, just like they were in North Africa, just like they were in Mesopotamia. Gazelle, deer, and the zebu cattle, wild varieties, are being intensively exploited. They're making grass baskets before they have ceramics, and they're lining them with bitumen. Bitumen is a resource that is mined, and it is sort of water tight. Uh, I used to use bitumen to line the foundations of houses that had leaks in their basement. You kind of put it's a powder. You put it on the side of that, and it repels water. So mixing that into your grass basket would mean that it could hold water then before a time of ceramics. Burial goods include some exotic trade items. We'll look at uh, what that is. Uh, but this is a mineral rich area. Lots of uh, interesting semi-precious stones come from Afghanistan. Mogar, the earliest house construction rectangular here, sort of reed thatched roofs um, on wooden poles. There's a door, windows, mud brick walls, which are plastered over with adobe. It's very similar to the constructions of today as well in those small, very rural villages in the mountains. Um, so mud brick construction subdivided internally. Some of the units were pretty small, like a closet. Uh, maybe these are storage silos for crops or seeds. Uh, maybe there's still some seasonal transhumans here. Transhumans meaning seasonal goings up and down between elevations, depending on um, the need or herding of, um, you know, collecting a wild gazelle or sheep that are also moving back and forth, migrating with seasons. Um, in Magar period 1a, as early as 6500 BC, we already see trade networks developing. They're trading turquoise, marine shells, steatite beads, these blue beads here, a lapis lousley, a beautiful semi-precious stone you may have heard of. Um, from the, the later Ravi phase here, you can see different kinds of beads, uh, steatite beads in particular, and terracotta beads from the Kotdiji phase. Um, so different types of beads from different periods of time. Beads are really a big deal to the Indus and the Harappa. They love their bead necklaces. Um, they don't collect them excessively. Almost everybody has some. Um, uh, you know, is it sort of a currency? Uh, nobody really has an excessive amount of it. So we can't like say there's social prestige happening here. They just like to wear their sort of bead necklaces. Uh, and that is something that continues through time. When we begin to see them use ceramics, at first it's in terms of artistic expression in these ceramic figurines or terracotta figurines. These um, examples are from period four from Magar. Terracotta figurines are found in all different kinds of periods, sort of crude at first, but they become more sophisticated through time. Uh, you can kind of see the one on the right here is a family unit. Uh, why they're all sort of bare-breasted, um, you know, who knows, but you can see the fancy hairstyles um, and almost helmet-like heads, very unique styles and representative um, of the period. Uh, it reminds me of when I see a minivan on the LIE and they have those little stickers on the back that's sort of mom, dad, the three kids, and sometimes they'll have the dog or the cat there um, and every now and then you'll see one with a, like seven or eight kids and you're like, wow, you know, that's a lot of kids. Um, but they'll put that on the back of their car today as sort of, I don't know why. I mean, maybe you have one on the back of your car and what are those stickers? But reminds me a lot of these ceramic figurines. It's not really ancestor worship. Maybe they're toys, maybe they're kids' toys. Um, it's difficult to know, but they're very common and popular, and they show up throughout these layers, and they continue to show up with the Harappan and the Indus as time goes on. Um, if we look a little later, 6,000 to 5,500 BC, ceramics appear in the decline of wild species with local domestication, of, in particular of zebu cattle here. You can see the hump on the back of this cow. Um, these uh, we saw in the genetic profile of cattle in Africa, they start to trade out and move around the old world uh, as well. Um, the, the genetics of these zebu end up in the gene pool of African cattle um, beginning very early on. So um, as an export from this region almost, but this is a, a local uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan variety of wild cattle that is domesticated there um, independently. 
and its uh, sort of physical appearance is unique. We have what we would call Brahma bulls in this country. They're sort of rare, but you'll see them in rodeos um, in other places is more of a novelty item, but they do exist and, and their heritage lies in this part of the world. So, I mean, they're around the world. Um, here you can see early Harappan period, this little um, uh, cattle ceramic figurine is sort of representative of um, some of the artistic expression and it shows the importance of uh, that cattle domestication. Uh, one way we know that cattle are being domesticated is they decrease in size from the wild varieties. The um, domesticated varieties are a little smaller and less aggressive, especially their horns um, and ceramic vessels begin to appear during the second period of Magar. Uh, burials, we see seashells, turquoise, lapis lazuli, crude clay figurines. There seems to be a slight bias toward the burial of men over women, but that just could be that there were more men. I mean, um, populations aren't always 50-50 men and women. Um, for example, I think there's like 51% female and 49% male in the United States population. It kind of varies, so that may not mean much, but maybe there is a gender bias somehow. Um, or hypersensitive to looking for bias in the Indus or Harappa because there just isn't a lot of evidence of any kind of inequalities among these so this society. And even when they reach the complex civilization level, we still don't see a lot of social inequities in the material culture that can sort of signify that social stratification has taken place. So that's one very interesting aspect of the Indus that St makes it stand out from other civilizations. So uh, we want to look at burials and see what they're buried with. Often there is a ceramic here. You can see that there's a ceramic vessel next to the head and then he's wearing a single sort of steep tight bead ne necklace. And that's very common of an Indus burial. Not a lot there. They're all more or less the same. Um, so, you know, make of it what you want, I guess. Numerous burials though in all different layers. Early, important early period burials have some of these grave goods, not excessive though, and certainly not gold and bronze and other things that we see like in other areas. In period three, we start to see an increase in the sophistication of ceramics. They're very well made. They're thrown on potter's wheels and traded outward. Um, stylistic representations here, you can see the painted animals on there that are important, often fish. Um, and in the river, you see this sort of um, occupation with water or focus on water and rivers, uh, obviously very important to them. Uh, and it shows up in the styles of their ceramics. Um, some foundational developments for the Indus civilization occurred during these Neolithic periods, farming of wheat and barley, pastoralism of sheep and goat and, and ranging of cattle. So we have everything that we need here for the rise of more complex societies. Um, interesting things that begin to show up in Magar periods four, around 4,000 to 3,800 BC. Some villages are intentionally abandoned, uh, but before they abandon one village, and Magar is one of these where they sort of moved the, the village um, to another area, they planned out and built the new village before they moved. That's highly unusual um, in human prehistory. It shows that they're, they're very organized um, and, and methodical, I would say, um, a lot of thought and a lot of preparation. And they played it out, they laid it out on a grid. Um, their vill villages are put out on pre-planned grids, like grid iron streets, almost like you know parts of Queens um, or, um, uh, Long Island, right, where you have gridded out streets um, of north and, and south and east and west. Um, and you can see pictures here from Magar and, and how these sort of structures were, were put out and pre-planned. Um, during this phase of regionalization periods 6 and 7, 3500 to 2600 BC, um, the DG phase is a very prominent part of this period. Sophisticated ceramic kilns, well-made, beautiful pottery, um, really quite a lot of emphasis on the ceramic figurines and use of clay ceramics uh, and firing of these. Um, they are not, they are mass produced or standardized. So it means that there are craft specialists whose job it is to make ceramics 
And so they probably aren't employed as farmers. They're, they just make ceramics all day and that's their job. So that is one indication of some specializations within their economy. Um, Cot DG indications of the Indus civilization is rising here. You can see now the shift to the sort of red slip um, pottery here, a globular in style, um, great for car carrying water. Uh, we have formally planned villages, wheel thrown globular jars and this red, red ware style of paint that shows up. Mud fired brick construction. So clay is also now being used to fire clay bricks and we still use clay bricks today. Think about all the red. I mean, the building I'm in is made out of red, red fired, clay fired, um, red bricks. Uh, massive firewood consumption. A lot of what they're producing requires kilns and fires, um, which means burning of wood in special ovens. It's much think of a bread oven or something like that, but firing of clay and, clay and to make these bricks. Bricks shared um, specific ratios. So two to four to six in size and all bricks are made to that ratio. Like they have the planning of their villages is down to the brick level. Like they have a mental template of what a brick should look like and, and they stick to it. Gridiron street planning, village fortifications that are probably more for floodwaters than enemy armies because we don't see a lot of evidence of militarization. There's no I, you know, iconography or depictions of warfare. There's no glorification of violence in any of their imagery. Um, and we don't see hordes of weapons and, a, and we don't see a lot of like um, pathologies on skeletons that would indicate um, a lot of endemic warfare. So very different than Mesopotamia. These are not warring city states. They are putting fortifications around their villages and cities, but it's to direct rainwater or flooding water um, away. So let's have a quick look here at some of the maps of the Indus Valley civilization, the early phases of the Harappan, 3300 to 2600 BC. Towns or villages are black dots. And the region that surrounds this culture core is shaded in uh, this sort of red or beige uh, right along the Indus River. You can see the Gagar Hakra River here also to its south uh, over on the sort of Indian, India side of, of the equation. Um, and you see Magar, uh, the site here. And in important sites like one of the capitals, Harappa, um, and then Kat Diji on the lower Indus, um, these are important sites. Um, for the early phases of the Indus. If we jump forward in time to 2600 and 1900, sort of the mature phase of the Harappan civilization, you can see their cultural sphere has expanded um, quite a bit here to include a lot of these coastal areas. And now you see Mohenjo-Daro rise up on the other side of the river from the Kat Diji village. It becomes a capital um, city. So we start to see differences in size of um, Harappan settlements from the small farming hamlets to the mid-sized towns, villages, uh, to the three major capital um, cities, if we could call them urban centers, Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, and the port city of Lothal down in the southeast um, becomes important for salt mining um, and, and coastal resources. So these become important larger scale major cities, you see some other major cities around this region too. Um, and they're all sort of planned out on the same kind of theme um, that we'll look at. So this is the era of integration where all of this region is integrated into a common culture core here from 2600 to 1900 BC. You have cities, urban planning, a lot of standardization in artifacts, in what we would call a four-tiered settlement hierarchy. There's like, there are four different kinds of settlements that I was just mentioning. The farming hamlet or small, very rural village to different sizes of cities, towns, and what we might call a regional capital. Um, there is a writing system that develops, and I'll mention that in a moment. Long distance trade, they're, they're trading with Mesopotamia. 
um, great, over great distances. This craft specialization within their economy. Um, here you can see some more little ceramic figurines or toys or whatever they are um, showing up. And they have monumental public works. They're building large scale buildings, a citadel, a public bath, um, and the Citadel implies sort of a military garrison, but there's no indication it was separate. Uh, these are public spaces that really it seems that most anyone that can come into the city could use, um, at least from our interpretation archaeologically. So two of the core cities, Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, um, are laid out in similar ways. There's a citadel and a lower town, an upper town and a lower town. And in most of these ancient societies, you would think, well, the upper town is where the religious elite, the priests or um, the wealthy uh, would live and occupy. And the lower town would be the peasants or the lower classes. It doesn't really seem to be laid out that way, um, as I had mentioned. Um, I mean, yeah, there's an upper and a lower, but the upper is that public bath that it seems that anyone could come um, in to visit. There are cisterns. Water storage is a really important part of the Harappa. They um, have very sophisticated sewer systems that rivaled anything else in the ancient world. They treated their waste, you know, the greatest threat to one of these sort of ancient civilizations is mixing of sewage water with drinking water or agricultural water for disease purposes. And uh, the Harappa were very sophisticated at managing different kinds of water. Um, they had great baths, there was ritual cleansing, um, what the Germans might call Wassersluss or water lock, um, translated as water lock, where, um, you know, the floodwaters would come in, they could store that water and set it aside for use later on in the dry season. So they are very sophisticated, not only at storing grains and barleys, but storing water for irrigation. Um, later on in a drier period of time. So management of water is really sort of an important part of this, of Wasser Sluice. Um, part of the technology involved in storing of water is lining their clay bricks with bitumen, that waterproofing agent that we talked about, a mineral that repels water. Um, and they referred to, or through their architecture, it seems that they recognized four types of water in different levels of purity. Um, rainwater, groundwater, river water, and sewage water in that order. Rainwater being the most pure form of water falls from the sky, it's the cleanest. Um, groundwater um, coming in second, you can drink groundwater, uh, it's fairly pure depending on the sediments that are below. And then river water flowing down out of the Himalayas um, is okay, but not as good as rainwater. And then there's sewage, which you don't want to touch, right? So different categories of water, so very sophisticated in terms of their water management. This is public works. Um, it takes bureaucrats to manage water, uh, and they have this really sort of masterful architecture. How is Indus socially organized? One's thought to be, of course, peaceful, um, utopia, egalitarian, uh, with very little, maybe some, but little elite differentiation between groups of people. There's no representations of war or warriors. So if there was a warrior class, we don't know about it because they never mentioned it and it doesn't show up archeologically. So it suggests to us there wasn't much of a military presence or, or warrior class. Lack of conspicuous material displays of wealth. If there is a wealthy elite class, they don't show it, they hide it, right? And this is sort of like a hunter-gatherer rule of thumb uh, where humility is praised, um, but opulent displays of wealth or arrogance is like the worst social sin that you could commit. And that may be, apply here as well because they are not showing off wealth um, if they do in fact have it. So there's a lack of this material display of wealth. There's a small number of some head trauma, meaning someone got whacked in the head um, and maybe there's some population distance differences, but it's really a small amount that for a civilization or any urban setting, there's not a lot of evidence for violence, a little bit, but not a ton. And it's an individual type of setting, not like group violence. 
Um, so no evidence of elite residences or elite spaces. If there is a social elite, their housing is very much the same as everyone else's. Now, can you imagine living in such a world like that or how that would work in our society? There's no preeminent burials that, that suggests this. And there's an absence of prestige items, except for these beautiful beads of semi-precious stones, which it seems like most of the population has some of. Um, they're not hoarding it or overly collecting it. It is a trade item. Maybe it represents some form of a currency, um, but it's just like items of personal adornment. They love their, look at this statue here. The person has bangles all the way up the side of their arm, wearing a necklace. Um, you know, uh, jewelry seems to be kind of their thing and popular. They have a strong economy and trade. There's standardized weights of things, lots of these little block weights that represent um, standard weights for trade and means. Um, dried salted fish was traded, lapis lazuli, uh, which Afghanistan is very rich in this blue semi-precious stone. Carnelian, in particular red carnelian for making a bead necklace. A steetite, which is a kind of a soapstone, easy to carve and make beads out of. Shells from the coast, chirps, copper, gold, tin, all show up in their trade and economy. Let's talk briefly about the Indus script, which is in use from 3500 to 1900 BC. Um, 3500 seems a little early, I think. Uh, for this, but it does show up. It's undeciphered. We can't read it. It's very unique. It often shows up with a large logographic animal representation. Here it's this sort of um, cow, or maybe that's a rhino. It's hard for me to tell. It could be a weird unicorn, um, all of which sometimes appear. Occasionally see an elephant, an Asian elephant. And then these characters of writing at the top um, as well. So it seems to be written from right to left, um, which is um, you know different than ours, and logo syllabaic, meaning it is a mixture of pictures, like hieroglyphics or like Maya um, would write, and also syllabaic, like um, sort of like the I guess early cuneiform um, or word signs, uh, symbols that represent words. Um, and phonetic syllables or um, a symbol that represents a part of a word. And that's about as much as we got. We can't decipher it. Um, it's difficult to read. There are not long, lengthy inscriptions of it. Um, the one at the bottom here is as bad a long of, uh, inscription as you get um, with these. And that makes it more difficult to decipher. We also don't have anything like a Rosetta Stone that has multiple written accounts in different languages, including the Indus script. Now, someday we may find that. Um, you know, they traded with Mesopotamia. So it is possible in some of the burials and the Persian Gulf, like say Bahrain, where some of the trade went, um, there may be Indus script. We do see Indus seals sometimes in Mesopotamia. It's very possible there will be a discovery someday of a clay tablet that has something written in cuneiform and something written in the Indus script of the same thing. And that would really, really help us decipher what this stuff is. But right now we can't read it. Um, it does appear in the Persian Gulf. Uh, it shows up in Euphrates Valley. It shows up in Bahrain, in the United Arab Emirates. There's less than 27 known different inscript, 2700, I sh should say, known inscriptions. You can see here that some different seals in the bottom left, the um, elephant seal I told you about and the rhinoceros seal. Um, but look at this uh, on the right, a couple of these. Uh, you see this, a wheel spoke sign, a daisy wheel sign, it's prominent. And then right in the middle, a man holding up two beasts, which we've seen with Gilgamesh, We've seen in other places, we saw it with Narmer, the representation of humans controlling or conquering of nature shows up here again in the Indus Valley. Um, so very sort of fascinating, wish we could read it, but we can't. So I'm getting close here uh, to wrapping this up. The eclipse of the Indus cities, 1900 BC, this era of localization and loss of things like their writing of their public monuments of central storage, planned urban forms, 
in a reversion back to these pre-urban traditions that we see. Uh, and here in this map, there's a lot happening, um, but it tells really this story of the rise and fall of the Indus. Sites that belong to early farming cultures are over on the other side of the mountains in Baluchistan and Afghanistan. Um, you can see these important sites um, here. Magar uh, is represented right in the middle of all of that. Those are early Neolithic sites. And then in the red circles or orange circles, sites that belong to the Indus civilization uh, along the Indus River and in between the Indus and the Gagar Hakara River, which has gone extinct. Um, and then you see some modern cities and the alluvial plain hills and different topography. But you see a general south easterly movement of settlements as we go through this period of time um, from Afghanistan through Pakistan into Northwest India. Um, and as uh, the eclipse of the Indus kind of unfolds, we see the uh, reversion back to just local Neolithic traditions. Uh, you don't have a central ceramic style anymore. You don't have a central planned city anymore. Those sort of fall apart and a reversion back to farming, small-scale Neolithic societies. What caused this decline? Um, remember all of those clay-fired bricks? One popular hypothesis is that they cut down so many of their trees and burned them to fire clay bricks and ceramics that it caused environmental degradation on a large scale. It may have uh, when you have deforestation, silts build up in your rivers, and we know that they lost an entire river in this process. The Gagar Hakra became silted over and it went underground. Um, it could also have been a tectonic event that caused the river to disappear. It seems like the disappearance of that river is key to the sort of decline of the civilization. So a lot of explanations focus on this river disappearing. Um, it's possible tectonic uplift caused the river to go underground. Um, uh, one popular theory that's sort of out of favor now, a foreign invasion by the Aryans from Iran that came in um, that's not as strongly supported by any of the evidence. Um, disruption in trades, um, more and more people looking at possible disease. I mean, there is this mass grave at Mohenjo-Daro which used to be thought of as sort of evidence of warfare, but a lot of them don't have blunt trauma to them. It's possible um, a virus killed a lot of people. Malaria may have moved in um, and we know what a pandemic can do to a civilization. And if you have a particularly devastating pandemic virus like malaria, it could cause major social upheaval. And so um, looking at virus spreads and pandemics is, um, kind of a top research priority at this point. 